as I shared earlier, my title, my, my focus today for my sermon is on Hosea Balu. This is the first in a series of sermons that I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to do a series on Unitarian Universalists who have made a difference. So some of them I'm pulling from way back, and I've got some that are still living today. Uh, now, there are so many to choose from, you could just go on and on and on. So I'm just, you're just going to have to go with what I selected for this time. And then maybe during our summer series next year, who knows, maybe some of you might want to share one of your favorite Unitarian Universalists that's made a difference. Well, this is Hosea Ballou. Here's his nice picture up here. He's a nice looking man there. And he's going to tell you a little about Hosea Ballou and Universalism. And again, the subtitle of this is Loving the Hell Out of Folks. Loving the Hell Out of Folks. Because I kind of think that might be something we all need to do in our world today. We might need to love them, just love the hell out of them. This man is Maturin Murray Ballou. This is the son of Hosea Ballou. Now, the Murray in his name is for John Murray. So he was named after John Murray. Although John Murray and Hosea Ballou did have some different theological ideas, they were both universalists and both very, very instrumental in spreading the universal word here in America. The reason I've got his picture up here is because he also was the bi biographer for Hosea Ballou. He wrote both a book for adults and a book for youth uh, so that folks could remember his dad and know a lot about him. And uh, uh, Now, I have to say, because I've read both of these, and um, I wonder if they're not a little biased. <laughs> but after all, it was his son writing about his dad. I mean, sure, this man, according to these biographies, was just the most wonderful man in the world, you know? So, but this is his son writing about his dad. I, maybe my children will <laughs> write about me like that. I don't know what they'll say about me when I'm gone. But hopefully, you know how you do when you write the obituary. You just put the good stuff in. You don't put it all in. It's kind of like the person that the preacher was preaching in, at a funeral, and the, somebody in the back was sitting there and said, let me get up there and look in that casket to see who. That doesn't sound like the man I knew. <laughs> but Hosea Ballou was a good guy. So here is how his son introduces the biography. He says, more than 80 years ago, when New England was comparatively in its youth, when the capitals of six states were but moderate-sized towns, when the localities now covered with smiling and thrifty villages were but uncleared forests, in which the trail of the red man was not yet obliterated, where the cougar still sought his prey, there was born in the town of Richmond, New Hampshire, April 30th, 1771, a child whose birth in that secluded spot gave little promise of his future eminence. This child, the youngest of 11, was named by his parents Hosea. And you can see the map of uh, New Hampshire there. The place where he was born was right down at the bottom there. Um, so, and he was the son of 11. Now, he did not have a privileged childhood at all. At all. Just how hard was it? Well, here are some of the hardships he had growing up. First of all, his dad was a Baptist minister. Now, I don't mean that to be a hardship, <laughs> although it could be. Actually, his dad was a Calvinist Baptist minister, what the, the, would be more like the primitive Baptist now. Uh, primitive doesn't mean primitive the way we think it of it. It means original. And what happened was as some of the Baptists began to send missionaries, the primitive Baptist broke off and said, no, we're not like that. We, don't, you know, we, we are Calvinists, and we uh, believe in predestination, that kind of thing. So his dad was that kind of minister. But the reason it was a hardship, he refused to be paid for his ministry. So though he was a minister, he refused to be paid. And therefore, he not, not only he had to work the fields wherever they were, but his children all had to work very hard, too. So that was a hardship. His mother, Lydia, died when he was two. He, never, he didn't remember her at all. He wore no shoes nor stockings, even in the winter. And there's stories about that, about his frostbite and how he'd 
still be able to move on. He worked the fields from early childhood. There was, was not a real childhood in his life. As soon as you were able to, you worked. This is a quote from his son. Though providence had so thinly clothed him and so scantily fed him, yet it placed a brave, bright, and cheerful spirit within him that caused him to make light of these inconveniences. Here are his own words about it. He said, I had the comfort, even in my old age, of remembering that I was deemed in our family circle to be a good child and marked for giving evidence of being less averse to necessary labor than others. Though this contributed somewhat to make me proud and to think well of myself, in other respects, it was of some advantage to me to be held in esteem by my mates, who ever showed that they had a peculiar regard for me held in high esteem because he was a hard worker and didn't complain. He was also a youthful entrepreneur. Hosea picked wild strawberries and other berries. Now, he always made sure he had some for his father's table, but he would sell the rest for a few cents. And then he would hoard those pennies, those cents, until he'd have enough to buy a book. Money was scarce. A lot of people, the way that they did was barter. They didn't even use money. But to get a book, you had to have money. So he would hoard that. Sometimes it would take a long time to get enough to get a book. But then that made him love that book all the more when he did have it. What about his education? Well, initially, there was only one book in the home. Of course, his dad being a minister, there was a Bible. So he taught himself to read and he taught himself basically from the Bible, getting his siblings when they would to help him because they, had knew, they taught each other and passed it down. The town they were in had no school, no public. It was too small, so it had no school. And then at night, he taught himself to write by the fireside. This is a picture that his son included in the book that would have been what this would have been. Like he said, his dad told him that he would get the lightest bark, strips of bark from the trees so that he could write on them. Then he would take the charcoal from the fire. That's what he used. And he'd take the Bible down and he'd practice making the letters and taught himself to write. Now, Hosea Balu did study a lot, studied the Bible a lot. And the beginnings of his, what we would call, some people would call heresy because it didn't go along with his Calvinist upbringing, began in his youth. He would question his father. He would doubt about something. He'd question his father in some of the church's teachings that he didn't think made sense and that from his reading of the Bible were not what it was supposed to be. His father would just raise an eyebrow. But he did stay in his father's church until he was grown. You know, I guess he knew <laughs> where he was fed. Many of us do the same things, don't we, you know? So he stayed in his father's church until he was grown. Now, his first school was something he and his friends did. Some of them that had saved up money from their little efforts at doing other things put their money together to hire someone to teach them. So his first school was actually a private school where they hired somebody. It didn't last long. I guess the person moved on away. But he, and he didn't get that much out of it because he probably was already past them, you know. But it was his first school, and he got a little bit of knowledge of some English grammar from there. But he wanted more, so he went to a neighboring community of Chesterfield. They did have a school, and he entered Chesterfield Academy in Chesterfield and stayed there enough, long enough, just a few months, but long enough with his other self-education that they felt that they could give him the recommendation and certification, we would call it, to be a teacher himself, to be a schoolmaster himself. So he was grown by then, and he could be a, not only do his farming, which he'd been doing, working the fields, all the ways, those things, doing anything else he could, but he could also be a schoolmaster. He said about his education, he said, I now set myself to work in earnest to obtain learning. I studied night and day, slept little and ate little, just focused on learning. 
But he didn't want to just be a teacher and farmer. He wanted to be a preacher. Wanted to be a preacher. I know that feeling, being a teacher and wanting to be a preacher. And he wanted to preach the doctrine, not his dad's doctrine. He wanted to preach the doctrine that he had come to believe, the universalist doctrine of love. Now, some people say he got that from others that were already preaching it, but his son said he came to the ideas himself a lot by his own study, by reading the Bible and studying. I understand that because people ask me a lot of times, how did you change your views on religion? And I said, I studied the Bible. You know, if you study it long enough, you know, you're going to question some things that maybe in your church teaches you sometimes. So he studied the Bible and he began to question some things and that's how he came to some of these conclusions. Now his first, his first efforts were problematic. Not, he had some problems with his preaching style for one thing that he worked on, but also they were problematic in other ways. He said, to the people the doctrine I preached was new and the opposition lacked not for bitterness. And such was my condition that I was constantly in conflict and never allowed to put off my armor to rest day or night. All manner of evil reports concerning me were invented and the worst of slander circulated. My answer to all of this slander was, while they speak thus falsely of me, I am in no anger. If I am injured, I shall do that myself. I'm in control of my own feelings and ideas, and I will not feel injury because of their slander. Um, so at first, they were not accepting because these, this, these ideas were not what they had been taught growing up. But after a while, he became more and more accepted, more and more people came, and they did like what he had to say. Now, when the Universalists, the first New England General Convention came along, he went to it. And the person that was doing the preaching there was Reverend Elhanan Winchester. And at the end of his sermon, he called up Hosea Ballou, who by then people knew and were thinking a lot of. He called him up and he took the Bible and pressed it firmly to his chest. He said, Brother Ballou, I press your heart to the written Jehovah. I press your heart to the written Jehovah. Then he declared that Hosea was ordained. You're ordained now. <laughs> That's it. Had a power effect, powerful effect upon the crowd. So with this event in his background, it's no surprise that he became an expert on thinking on his feet because he just didn't know what might come up. Here's an example. He was riding the circuit one time, and these circuit riders would ride around and preach in all these little churches, you know, because they didn't have enough. They'd go around. I'd go back and forth to Brunswick, circuit riders, circ travel around. I don't have a horse. But anyway, he was riding with the Baptist preacher, and they were arguing theology, of course. At one point, the Baptist pastor said, Brother Ballou, if I were a universalist and feared not the fires of hell, I could hit you over the head, steal your horse, and saddle and right away, and I'd still go to heaven. Balu said, if you were a universalist, the idea would never come to you. <laughs> <laughs> so what about a family life? Yes, he did have a family. While minister at Dana, Massachusetts, he met Miss Ruth Washburn, Washburn and married her one year later. He was 25 when they got married, and she was in her 18th year. So she was 17. <laughs> Can't imagine that. <laughs> All right, some of you know my story. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he was married, to, and her son, uh, their son writes, this noble-hearted woman lived and trod with him for more than half a century, the rugged path in life, sharing his joys and sorrow, and ever loving and beloved formed an example of purity and devotion never excelled. So the stories are generous about his love for her, and also the stories are generous about his love for his children. He had three sons, and all of them became universalist ministers, 
and two daughters, and both of them married Universalist ministers. My grandmama said, Jane's such a good child. I believe when she grows up, she'll marry a minister. <laughs> I didn't, but I am one. <laughs> so he had three sons, all became ministers, and two daughters, and both of them married ministers. He also had a grandnephew that some people confuse him with. This was his namesake. His nephew was also called Hosea Balu. He was Hosea Balu II. He was his grandnephew, and he was the founder of Tufts University. So some people say, oh, Hosea Balu, founder of Tufts University. That was his grandnephew, also a minister. This is an image that his son put in the book in his biographies, and he labeled this as a domestic scene. This would be what it would look like at his house. You see the mom's over there doing her needlework. His dad is studying the Bible. He was a writer. He wrote uh, a, a lot, a lot. But some of his early writings, uh, he wrote um, a book called Notes on the Parables, which was quite popular. He wrote a series of letters in defense of divine revelation. He wrote the child's scriptural catechism. So he had a catechism for universalist children. And then his most popular book is the Treatise on Atonement. And I'll tell you more about that later. But you can see a quote about it from the Evangelist magazine. It said, the decided manner in which the doctrine of vicarious atonement is rejected, the prominence given to the belief that Jesus was a dependent being, dependent like ourselves, on a common father and God, and that he was sent to preach the truth and illustrate its requirements, and by his exclusive influence to reconcile man to his maker, were subjects so new, so startling, that for a time the work appeared not to have been well received. Later, the work obtained unbounded popularity. So you might have to read that again, but you can see from reading that, one of the things he's declaring in this Treatise on Atonement is Unitarianism. Hosea Ballou was not only a Universalist, he was a Unitarian. Now, he wasn't a member of the Unitarian group that, that organized Channing and those folks. They were actually a different class of folks, and that was a problem with, I think, them getting together back then. The Unitarians were the Harvard-educated folks. They kind of ran with one crowd. Hosea Ballou was a, came from a working-class background. And sadly, at that time, those folks did not get together. Uh, although many of his ideas, if you read them, were similar to their ideas, their ideas. When I read this book, I said, wow, you know, I can't believe that he and Channing never got together, but they did not. Um, but many did read them. Some people think, though, that some of the Unitarians may have read some of Ballou's works, and that may have given them some of their ideas and strengthened them on some of those ideas about uh, uh, not Trinitarianism, that Jesus... Uh, was not God, but was sent by God to teach us how to live. To teach us how to live. Now, uh, he went to several little churches in New England, all around, and all those little churches he was at, he always had to teach school and farm too, you know, just anything he had to, because he had to make a living too, and the church, those small churches did not pay him enough. But then in Boston, they built the Second Universalist Church, Second Universalist Society, and they built it really for him. They wanted him. They built it and invited him to come be the minister there in Boston. And he became settled there. And uh, then he just had one church that he went to all on Sundays. He had two services that were both packed, packed with folks. But uh, on the weekdays, instead of farming and teaching school, that's when he would travel around and preach in other places. So he still traveled a lot, spreading that universal love, but he remained in this church until retirement. Capacity crowds. Also, while he was in Boston, he began to edit the Universalist magazine and write many, many other writings. So he's written a whole lot, and he is quoted a whole lot. So I'm just going to share with you a few of his famous quotes. A single bad habit will mar an otherwise faultless character as an ink drop soileth the pure white page. Exaggeration is a blood relation to falsehood and nearly as blamable. 
Hatred is self-punishment. Hatred is the coward's revenge for being intimidated. Real happiness is cheap enough, yet how dearly we pay for its counterfeit. And this one, doubt is an incentive to truth and patient inquiry leadeth the way. These quotes and many others are as good today as way back then, as way back then. And what are some other takeaways we can get from somebody from so long ago? I put down a lot of the words that uh, were describing him and some of his own words. And you know, you can put those in a word cloud and you can push a button and it makes a little word cloud on the computer. So I did that and this is what came up. So here are some of the things, punctual, he always on time, you know, that was a big deal from the youth on, never late. Upright, humble, good, he studied, teacher, uh, thoughtful, industry, perseverance, happy. He was a happy person. He played a lot with his children, had a good time with them, teased a lot. There were some stories about those kinds of things. Listen to folks, was humble. Now this word cloud ended up as a cross. I don't know why it did that, but it did. <laughs> uh, maybe because I had preacher and all these other things in it, you know how some of the software is. I don't know that he would have liked that. He didn't, he didn't focus on the cross. He didn't focus on Jesus' death because he did not think that, that Jesus had to die so that we could get to heaven, die for our sins. He did not believe in that aspect of things. He thought that God loved everybody and everyone would be saved. This treatise on atonement that I talked about earlier, if you read it right on the inside cover, it, it stretches the words out like this, at one meant. One being the, if you take the old way of pronouncing it, like an only on Atone, so it's atonement, but being at one, at one with God, or at one, we might, some of us would say, how can I be at one with the divine, or at one with love, or one with sacred if we're not theist? But how can you become one with that loving spirit that many of us strive to do? And even though he said that love was there for us, he said God, that God didn't need to be reconciled to us. We didn't have to do any sacrifices to get in God's favor. He said we needed to be ourselves. We need to reconcile ourselves to God. Or we need to reconcile ourselves, we might say, to love or to the divine, to being living in, in, in that divine spirit. We have to do some stuff to make ourselves ready for that. And one of the things we have to do in our world today with all of this divisiveness and all this separating ourselves and things, we have to be willing to forgive. To forgive others and forgive ourselves. We have, in our own denomination, been struggling lately because we have woken up to the fact that we have a lot of systems of white supremacy. Even we as Unitarian Universalists, we all want to pat ourselves on the back, but we have some problems that we have to deal with, and it's been going way, way back, and it's still with us today. And we can be bitter about it, but we can also be forgiving of ourselves so that we can change ourselves, getting loving relationships, move forward in love, and forgive other people too. And this is how we come to atonement. You 12-step folks might say, okay, yeah, we got that. We make amends, you know? If you don't make amends and you don't start, sit down and think about what's my part in all of this, and forgive folks, forgive yourself, it's hard to heal. We had a minister who wrote a litany, on a, a, a litany of atonement that I think Hosea Ballou would say amen to. So I'm going to close out 
the sermon today by sharing this litany of atonement. And I'm going to put it up here in a minute. It's in the back of your book, too. I'll read the plain Jane words, and you read the italics words. And you're going to be reading the same thing over and over again, which is simply, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that we have struck out in anger without just cause, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For the selfishness which sets us apart and alone, we forgive, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For losing sight of our unity, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the illusion of separateness, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin in love. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.